A couple of things to mention before we get started here. Uh, the weather kept a lot of you away from church last weekend, and understandably so, but you missed the opportunity to be introduced to our new uh, student ministries director, Dylan Stanick, and his lovely wife, Kayla, who have joined the church staff. Uh, Dylan's going to be in charge of youth ministry and also help us out with some technology and contemporary worship. So we welcome uh, Dylan and Kayla, and they get to experience their first youth dessert auction. I think my jaw dropped most of that first time uh, I got to experience that. I also want to mention that uh, we have an upcoming walk to Emmaus in April. The men begin on April 16th, the women on April the 23rd. We've talked a lot about this before. Uh, one of the reasons I'm, I encourage people to go to the walk to Emmaus is I think more than anything it helps people understand this idea of God's grace that we talk about so much. The purpose of Emmaus is to raise up leaders for the church. Uh, if you might be interested, uh, talk to me, talk to anybody who's been, and we'll be happy to get you some information and sign you up for that, April 16th, April 23rd. Also, tonight we have a Lenten cluster, a cluster Lenten service at West Salem Trinity United Methodist Church. Uh, yours truly is preaching. Now, I'll, I'll confess, it's a rerun, so you've heard it before. Uh, but I'll be preaching, our choir will be singing, and, uh, and hope you show up and represent your church well tonight at 6 o'clock at West Salem Trinity. Uh, we're continuing in this uh, series on being United Methodist, and you have some notes in your bulletin. If that helps you to follow along and maybe remember some of the key points, the scripture lesson I want to use is the one Mary alluded to, uh, the first 10 verses of Ephesians uh, chapter 2. You were dead. Through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But, but God who is rich in mercy... Out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." Verses 8 and 9 are what we're focusing on today, and I'd like for us to say uh, the words on this screen together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, and not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And the passage ends by saying, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I still vividly remember walking to school every day in third grade with three very good friends who lived on my street. We always took the same route. We walked a couple of very long blocks down the paved concrete alley that ran behind our homes and the houses on the next street. And then we'd hang a left on Yale Drive and walk two short blocks to O'Henry Elementary School. Our conversations were always rich and in-depth, as you would expect of third graders. And quite often we talked about religion. Largely because one of my friends and his family attended what we would now call a fundamentalist church. To this day, I still remember my friend Jack describing with great passion and intensity an eternal lake of fire where God was going to send anyone who wasn't saved. I still remember how strange and foreign this sounded to me. I'd never heard such talk in the United Methodist Church to which my family belonged. As my friend was, spoke with such urgency about the fires of hell and this angry, wrathful God, I remember how different it was from all that I'd heard and was taught in my own church. And honestly, I never felt 
scared or threatened or guilt-ridden by what Jack described because it almost sounded like he was talking about another religion, at least a different kind of Christianity. Indeed, another God who was very different from the God I already instinctively knew within my own heart to be a loving, caring being. All three of those friends ended up having some involvement in that fundamentalist church, and two of them, in fact, eventually enrolled in its private school and graduated from it some years later. Now, what I can tell you today is that some 40-plus years later, none of them have any real association with traditional Christianity. One of them, who's among my very best friends, my longest standing best friend, describes himself as an agnostic. Another is now into what I would describe as more New Age spirituality and positive thinking. And she's told me how damaged she was by that church. And the third, Jack, who was so emphatic about the eternal destiny of heathen friends like myself, I've encountered him once as an adult, and he told me how damaging that church and that kind of fundamentalist religion had been for him and for his family. They'd been pillars of the church at one point. But when I spoke with him, they were done with it. They were done. I share this with you because, first of all, I don't think we United Methodists talk quite enough about the whole idea of salvation. And because of that, many of us do not really understand or we're unfamiliar with our rich Wesleyan and Methodist view of salvation. And what often happens is that that void gets filled in by a lot of other expressions of Christianity, which are very different from who we are and what we embrace as Methodists. John Wesley, our Methodist forefather in the Church of England, wrote and published a sermon in 1765 titled, The Scripture Way of Salvation, which in part served to refute some of his critics, but also attempted to make clear for those early Methodists his understanding of the meaning of faith and salvation. He used a favorite scripture of his as the basis of his sermon, Ephesians 2.8, a part of our scripture lesson this morning, which in the King James Bible says in part, Ye are saved through faith. You are saved through faith. Wesley begins with the question, what is salvation? And what he says ought to perk up our ears. Wesley writes, The salvation which is here spoken of is not what is frequently understood. The going to heaven, eternal happiness? It is not the soul's going to paradise, termed by our Lord Abraham's bosom. It is not a blessing which lies on the other side of death, or as we usually speak, in the other world. Are you paying attention? (laughs) He continues the very words of the text itself, Ephesians. Put this beyond all question. Ye are saved. It is not something at a distance, it is a present thing, a blessing which, through the free mercy of God, ye are now in possession of. Wesley goes on to acknowledge that the verse from Ephesians may also be properly translated as ye have been saved, as the lesson I read earlier expresses it. And he concludes, so the salvation which is here spoken of might be extended to the entire work of God from the first dawning of grace in the soul till it is consummated in glory. Now there's a lot to unpack here, but let me try to help you understand. First, Wesley is saying that salvation isn't just something that lies in the future, the promise of heaven or avoiding hell. No, he's insisting that salvation is something here and now in our possession. Salvation is a part of our present existence, our present reality. Salvation, you see, is about experiencing life with God right here, right now, in all of its fullness, abundance, and depth. A second thing to note is that Wesley doesn't speak of salvation as just a one-time conversion experience that you might have. He's, he is saying it is a process that begins from our first awareness of God's grace 
until God's salvation is finally made full and complete in glory. Salvation embraces all of life. Wesley continues by describing how God's grace works in this ongoing experience of salvation. For some of you, this might be familiar. For others of you, it may be the first time you've heard some of this. Wesley begins by speaking of prevenient grace. He also calls it preventing grace. Prevenient means going before. It's the grace that goes before. And it is God's moving and acting within your life before you are even aware of it. It is God trying to get your attention and wooing you into a relationship with Him. As I was thinking about this this morning, I remember an older woman in the Carrier Mills Church who had prayed for years and years that her son would come back to the church and come back to faith. And uh, he'd been working as a coal miner. He'd served in Vietnam. And uh, while I was in that church, that happened. And that was an answer to her prayers. You see, provenient grace was at work through her prayers and in his life, bringing him back to faith. And uh, he left the Methodist church, became Assemblies of God. I mean, her prayers really (laughs) were quite effective. Now, once God has gotten your attention, Wesley tells us, God's justifying grace invites you to say yes to this relationship of love that God offers you. Through justification, we say yes to the relationship God wants to share with us. We say yes to the gifts of love and grace and mercy that God showers upon us through Jesus Christ. One way of thinking about it is this. Provenient grace is like dating and falling in love, wooing another. And justifying grace is like getting married and saying, I do. Now some folks have a very powerful moment of conversion in which their lives are dramatically changed as they receive and accept the gift of God's salvation in their lives. But we've got to be honest is that not everyone has that kind of experience. When some of us attended a a conference at Grace United Methodist Church in Florida a year or so ago, Pastor George Acevedo asked the group how many of us had had a Damascus Road conversion experience, like Paul getting knocked off his horse and and blinded by the light of Christ, a voice speaking to him. About 20% of the folks in that gathering raised their hands. And he said that this is like a light switch conversion. You know, it's off one minute and then you flick it and it's on, okay? He then asked how many in the crowd had a slow and gradual coming to faith. And the remaining 80% of us raised our hands, which he said is typical of most gatherings where he asks this question. And he said this is more like a dimmer switch conversion. The light of God's love becomes brighter and brighter in our lives until we finally give in and say yes to God. 80%. I'll be honest with you. I was raised in the church, I was raised in a Christian family, I was raised in the Christian faith, and I cannot remember a moment in my life when I was not aware of God's presence in my life in some kind of way. I cannot name a single great moment of conversion. But let me tell you, I can, I can tell you of many dramatic moments in my life, many dramatic conversion moments when God has drawn me closer and closer and closer to Him. And the truth is, I have to say yes to God each and every day that I live, not just once. And I hope you're still with me because we're not done with Wesley. This is perhaps the most important. Salvation does not end. It is not finished with our justification because God then wants us to continue growing in grace. We call this sanctification, which essentially means growing in holiness. Wesley says, we are inwardly renewed by the power of God. We feel the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, producing love to all mankind and more especially to the children of God, expelling the love of the world, the love of pleasure, of ease, of honor, of money, together with pride, anger, self-will, and every other evil temper. In a word, changing the earthly, sensual, 
devilish mind into the mind which was in Christ Jesus. You see, salvation isn't just about justification, and it doesn't end there. It's not over once you've been converted or saved, if you will. God wants you and me to grow in grace, and our salvation is also a matter of our daily walk with God. Now, believe it or not, there's still more. If salvation is understood as a process or a journey of growing in grace, we need to know what our destination is. What is the end goal of this saving experience? And that is perfection, which in Wesley's understanding simply means being made perfect in God's love. Our relationship with God matures to the point where God's love controls all of our thoughts, all of our motives, all of our desires. To this day, when we United Methodist pastors are ordained, our bishop asks us the same question that Wesley asked of his preachers. Are you going on to perfection? And that should be our ultimate goal if we are grow, growing in God's grace. You know, do you desire to be made perfect in God's love? You know, perfection is maybe not the best word in a contemporary setting, and a better word might be maturity. You know, do you desire to, to be made fully mature, to grow up in God's grace and become what God wants you to be? I know this may sound kind of overwhelming, but you know, it's a very important subject, and, and it's something a lot of us Methodists really need to understand. And if I had to put it in the most simple way possible, it might be something like this. Salvation is a relationship offered to you by a God who has been pursuing you from the moment you were born, if not before, which is provenient grace. God wants you to say yes to that relationship of love made possible through Jesus Christ. God wants you to receive His gifts of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. That is justifying grace. And then God wants you to grow and be filled with His grace in order to become everything that He has created you to be. And that is sanctifying grace, which leads us to perfection in God's love. If you're tired of Wesley, or if you're confused by him, let's look at what Ephesians says to us. First, let me point out, in contrast to the angry, hacked-off God that so many Christians are drawn to, we hear Ephesians describe a God who is rich in mercy, a God who, out of the great love with which He loved us, makes us alive together with Christ. And then we hear the, the how and what of salvation in verses 8 and 9. What did it say? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. Let's parse that a bit. For by grace, grace which is God's undeserved, unconditional love for you and me. For by grace you have been saved. The Greek word also means healed, which is really how Wesley tended to use and understand the term. We are healed of our brokenness and sin, for Wesley, salvation was therapeutic. It is God's work of healing and restoring us to the image of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, which simply means placing your heartfelt trust in what God has done for you, trusting in God's goodness, trusting in God's love. By grace through faith, you have been saved, you are saved, you're being saved. And this isn't anything you do. It is the gift of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I like gifts. <laughs> That's good news for me. And the best gift of all is God's saving, healing love offered to you and me through a relationship made possible by Jesus Christ. A relationship that we can experience right here and right now. Dr. Donald Haynes is a Retired United Methodist pastor who occasionally writes a column for the United Methodist Reporter, which is now an exclusively online publication. In one of his columns a few years ago, Dr. Haynes described an interesting incident that took place at his church. 
His local faith community, he says, is a typical First United Methodist Church in a small town, an aging congregation that needs children and their parents. So here's what they did. They decided to hold a children's festival for the whole town. They rented huge inflatable games, they played contemporary praise music, and they cooked hot dogs for everyone who showed up. At lunchtime, Reverend Haynes went out to the festival to see how things were going and to show his support, as well as to eat a free hot dog. Preachers never pass on free food, let me tell you. And as he was eating his hot dog, a member of the church named Susan came up to him and handed him a card that read, The Theology of Fundamentalist Soul Winning. She then explained to Dr. Haynes that a group from a local church had infiltrated their festival, passed out these tracts, and then gone around asking everyone if they were saved. Susan said, I told them I was going to heaven when I die, but right now I'm making hot dogs for the kids. Can you believe this, she said. Now, as you may know, nearly all of these tracts begin by saying, you're a sinner. And they typically cite Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's hard to argue with that. It's true. However, Reverend Haynes told Susan that we as United Methodists believe that God's way of salvation really begins not with Romans 3.23, but with Genesis 1.27. So God created humankind in God's own image. He explained to Susan that before you even get to the reality of sin and the problem of sin, there is the first and fundamental truth that we are beloved children of God created in His image. That salvation begins with God's love and not our sin. That salvation is offered because God loved us first. That God's forgiveness of our sin is made possible because of God's great love. For us. See the difference, he asked Susan. She smiled and said, Thanks, you just taught me something that I never heard before. And that feels good. My brothers and sisters, maybe you've never heard it before, and I hope to be as simple and as straightforward as I can. God loves you, and God has been pursuing you without your even being aware of it. God wants a relationship with you and eagerly desires for you to say yes to that relationship which He offers you through Jesus Christ, a relationship filled with love and joy and and mercy and forgiveness. And God wants you to grow in that relationship, a relationship that is personal and intimate, a relationship that is life-giving and life-changing, a relationship that is here and now and not just something you're waiting for on the other side of death. You see, by grace, God's unconditional, undeserved love, you are saved and healed of your brokenness, your lostness, your selfishness. Through faith, simply trusting in God's goodness and mercy and the love shown to us in Jesus. And this is not your own doing. It's not something you've done. It is God's gift freely offered to each and every one of you today, here and now.